present is a 23 years old gentleman from Montana. Actually, he's a very active um, uh, young guy. Um, six months ago, he started to feel that he no longer can pull a 50 pounds, um, the hunting ball. And then the um, uh, three months later, then he no longer can pull a 20 pounds ball. Um, then initiated some workup. Also, he has some mild uh, neck uh, pain. On the physical exam, he has uh, both uh, side the deltoid, the biceps weakness, um, the uh, Motor score we got is like 95 um, with some weakness on the um, deltoid and the um, biceps. The, um, the, uh, I mean, obviously, he's grossly malopathic as well with Hoffman, with Babinski, Uncle Colonus. Um, this is the imaging study we got. We got the um, MRI scan, which shows there's a lesion in the cervical. It's a high signal on the T2 and uh, wrap around the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the one side of the vertebral artery as well with cord compression. And uh, further workup shows this on the T1 is kind of like a low or ISO intensity and uh, the, with, with the very mild, the enhancing, peripheral enhancing on the, um, with the contrast. And the uh, CAT scan um, doesn't show much the uh, bony um, erosion, but it just has the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, some dentation into it with the sclerotic margin. And uh, we got a CTA, which shows a bilateral dominant word. Um, so the question um, is that, you know, should we get a biopsy first or should we just go for the surgery? Um, the, um, we actually initially offered the patient the biopsy, but the patient kind of uh, denied they wanted to get surgery done. And also, you know, the patient had the severe cord compression with the significant malopathic symptoms. Um, and then if we go for the surgery, the question is that should we go from anterior first <coughs> Uh, should we go posterior first uh, with the combined front and the back surgery? And uh, our second case. So we'll, we'll finish off <coughs> what we actually put, uh, did on these surgeries um, after our, our block of presentations. So this last case is a 57-year-old male who presented with back pain, in one physical therapy, had persistent back pain, he was neurologically intact. Imaging was obtained, and uh, ultimately this mass within the sacrum was discovered. Um, this is biopsy proven to be chordoma uh, of the sacrum. Um, and I guess, and, and the issues really for discussion are, um, well, resection is the obvious surgical plan if the patient is agreeable to it. And the, and the question is really not so much um, if, this if this needs to be resected, but rather um, what, are, what are the surgical approaches, anterior approach, posterior approach, b uh, combined approach, and also the need for ileal lumbar reconstruction. Just looking at this image here, uh, what needs to be done to stabilize the uh, um, spinal column, if anything, afterwards. Uh, next up is uh, Carla Bellabarba, who's one of our full professors here at Harvard Medical Center. Uh, uh, most of you in the room already know him. He does a lot of trauma, but has extensive experience in spine tumor care as well. So without further ado, uh, Carla. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, Mike and Fung Yi, for inviting me to, to speak here. I thought that was a fantastic lecture. I just, uh, I just thought one of the best understatements of the, of the lecture was, I don't do much microsurgery. So I'm going to talk about uh, costal transrectectomy. This is uh, this is essentially what I can call a lowbrow lecture, which are my favorite types of lecture, in the sense that I'm not going to talk much about data. There isn't a ton of data to begin with. I'm really just going to show, uh, for the most part, technical aspects of the procedure and some cases, and just go over some of the some of the uh, uh, points of of the procedure. Now, I will show, although this is uh, this is obviously. Uh, primarily tumor-based. I will show some examples that are outside the realm of tumor just because they'll demonstrate some of the principles that I'm, I'm uh, trying to demonstrate. And I'll also show some cases at the end, if I have time, that are non-tumor-based because this is such a versatile approach that uh, I think it's, a, it's an interesting uh, tool to have in your armamentarium for, for various types of procedures. So this, as you know, uh, this, this technique was originally developed for decompression only. Of, uh, of tuberculosis, of anterior, abs anterior paraspinal abscesses and tuberculosis, uh, with various modifications and obviously progression and enhancements of instrumentation, it's become very useful from a reconstructive standpoint. It's something that uh, seems to be becoming increasingly popular, which I think is nice to see because it's been a versatile tool that I think was uh, highly underused even, I think, as recently as five to ten years ago, and perhaps even now. Uh, it has several advantages over an anterior approach, and that's uh, the fact that you can have a simultaneous exposure of all three columns, essentially 
uh, manipulate the spine at will, and you can get circumferential decompression whilst doing this release. And in some cases, that's merely an advantage, and in some cases, that's essential. Disadvantages is that, um, and this is probably increasingly less so, but I would say that it's less familiar to surgeons than the anterior approach or combined anterior and posterior approaches separately. And I'd say the primary disadvantage is that it does require working around the spinal cord. And uh, so there's a concern that perhaps it's a technique that results in a greater potential for neurological injury, though that really hasn't been borne out with the, at least with the type and quality of literature we have available. So these are the basic principles, uh, neurological decompression, anterior and posterior release simultaneously, plus or minus osteotomy <coughs> versus simply tumor resection, correction of the deformity, and then anterior interbody support with multi-level posterior instrumentation. Again, advantages, simultaneous anterior and posterior control, as well as being able to accomplish all this through a single approach. As far as which pathologies uh, respond well, obviously tumor, in fact, tumor and infection, I think, are the ideal uh, pathologies for this. Uh, fixed kyphotic deformity, I think, uh, in, depending on the situation, uh, can, it can be quite useful. Anterior column insufficiency and then fracture as well to some extent. I'd say it's, it's not something that's used particularly commonly in the acute fracture um, setting. The locations where it, it's, it can be used, really T2 to L1, and it's limited primarily, and actually, well, as you saw, a variation can be used in the cervical spine, but I'd say that at this point, that's, uh, that's limited to, to a very small and particular subset of perhaps one uh, who's, who's in the room. But uh, for, the, for, uh, primary purposes of, for the primary purposes of this lecture, really T2 to L1 are the, um, are the levels where the formal uh, posterior lateral approach, I think, is most commonly used. It's particularly advantageous, I find, in the upper thoracic spine because it's an area that isn't easily accessible through uh, thoracotomy. And uh, I think has really, uh, my, uh, for me, has really facilitated my ability to treat uh, pathology in that, at that level. Uh, depending on the situation, it may require sacrificing a nerve root uh, per level, and that's one of the reasons that you can have some limitations as far as where you can use it. Why not anterior alone? What makes it so much different? And obviously this isn't a tumor case, this is a flexion distraction injury, but demonstrates the fact that correction of deformity through, a anterior, uh, through an anterior approach alone can be difficult. And I'd say that's, that isn't any uh, less true for tumor surgery. And here's an example of actually an osteomyelitis case, a patient with a relatively fixed uh, kyphotic deformity, as you can see a spondylodiscitis and a progressive neurological deficit. And after anterior alone, you can see that there's a substantial amount of kyphosis left and requiring uh, posterior facetectomy and correction, which gave a reasonable result, but again requires a, a dual exposure, something that in all likelihood can be achieved through one exposure with a costal transversectomy approach. In some fixed, de some fixed deformities such as these, uh, three-stage anterior, posterior, anterior um, reconstructions are required in order to properly mobilize all segments and then uh, get the correct alignment as well as reconstruction. And obviously this is something that can be approached again through a single approach. And uh, that's one of the advantages. And you'll see that the, uh, the reconstructive processes here, the reconstructions are somewhat antiquated when it comes to the instrumentation used because it's actually quite difficult for me to find in our institution any front back front procedures at these levels anymore because we've been using the costa transversectomy for, for so long uh, fairly effectively. As far as the complication profile, there, uh, there isn't a, a lot of good quality data comparing, um, comparing the uh, complication profile of anterior alone or anterior posterior versus costal transversectomy. And this is just one paper that actually out of our institution, which is no better or worse than a lot of the uh, other papers, where we look particularly at the treatment of neoplasms, 47 neoplasms out of 142 patients total. This is back in uh, 2001, so it's quite a while ago. And we noted that obviously within the, the uh, context of a very small group and therefore <coughs> statistical power that isn't particularly good, there was a similar complication rate between patients in group one, which uh, you'll see in on the table in a second, which were the cost of transversectomy group, and group two, which are those treated with anterior plus or minus posterior <coughs> approach as well. And this is the complication profile. Now you will note that uh, the concern I mentioned previously, there were two patients who had a neurological decline. One of them was permanent and one of them was temporary. Uh, 
um, in the costal transversectomy group versus none in this group. And the, the, the cohort is really too small to, for that to be statistically significant, but it does, I think, highlight at least the possibility that this is something uh, that one needs to be concerned about. And I think uh, theoretically and logically you would think that's the case just because of the way the procedure is. Um, this is, this table indicates the preference for costal transversectomy within our institution, and you'll see that the black represents uh, costal transversectomy done at a specific level, and then the uh, diagonally shaded area is the anterior, anterior, posterior, and you see that there's a considerable, considerably <coughs> greater preference up to T9, and then it becomes somewhat 50-50. Uh, I would say that over the years, this has probably shifted more towards co costal transversectomy, but uh, this illustrates what I was saying before. It's just particularly at these levels, it's, it's, uh, it's more challenging to do thoracotomies and anterior reconstructions in particular. The anatomy doesn't lend itself well to it, and that's an area where costal transversectomy is particularly useful. Multi-level procedures are also an advantage, a more extensile approach than, uh, the, anterior, uh, than the anterior exposure. And also, we, we noted that uh, a, a higher percentage of basically sicker patients, patients who we did not want to subject to a thoracotomy for various reasons in all likelihood, patients with metastatic disease, and I think that's obvious. I think if you need to go for the widest possible resection of costal transversectomy, depending on the situation, of course, is usually not the way to go. Um, so this is really a, a primarily used for metastatic disease. And when, you say, when we say costal transversectomy, there's really a spectrum of posterolateral approaches, and these can be used for anything from disc, uh, from resection of disc herniation to tumor, of course. And it, these involve uh, resection of either facet alone or pedicle and facet, perhaps, and, and some, of the, uh, uh, some of the rib. And then ultimately, this is the more formal costal transversectomy with resection of the rib out several centimeters out laterally, as well as the lamina transverse process and pedicle, et cetera, and part of the vertebral body. And this would be the, uh, the MAC daddy, I guess, is the lateral extracavitary approach, which, as you can see, leaves the paraspinals behind and has a much more horizontal or uh, a transverse approach to the uh, vertebral body but also has some disadvantage as, far, disadvantage as far as your ability to get circumferential access to the spine. And what I'm going to focus on really is the more classic costal transversectomy. I'd say it's the workhorse for the, for the type of procedures we're discussing and the one that's uh, most commonly used. And here's just an example of what we try and achieve. As you can see, this is a transverse cut at the level of the thoracic spine. We basically resect as the lamina, transverse process, pedicle, Part of, the, uh, part of the rib several centimeters out and ultimately gain access to the anterior spinal canal, the anterolateral aspect of the vertebral body, and can perform the resection. This can be done either unilaterally or bilaterally as needed and ultimately can uh, also result in a reconstruction. These uh, pictures that I have are, 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 uh, are beautiful pictures, classic for Larry Rines and, and M.D. Anderson. They, have a wonderful, they must have a wonderful artist over there, and he's given me permission to use these uh, in the past as well as today to illustrate the, uh, the, uh, the technique. So generally speaking, for anything but the lateral extracavitary approach, we use a midline incision. A lateral ex extracavitary approach would, generally speaking, require a, uh, a more paramedian incision, but again, that depends on the, the situation as well. Um, then a laminectomy is performed next, and this is important, placement of a single temporary rod, a uh, unilateral temporary rod prior to resection of the posterior rib, transverse process, facet, and then ultimately the uh, vertebral body. At this point, if a nerve root's going to be sacrificed, it's traced out from the, from the uh, intercostal area of the rib up towards the uh, the spinal canal and the, uh, the nerve root is sacrificed. Obviously, thoracic nerve roots generally can be sacrificed uh, with little to no um, morbidity. Again, temporary rod extremely important. At this point, you have access to the lateral cortex of the vertebral body, so through blunt dissection, you can actually use the bovi quite freely here, unlike in the lumbar spine where the nerve roots uh, traverse in proximity to the, to the body and the psoas. You can, you can use the the bovi quite liberally here, or blunt dissection, watching for the uh, segmental vessels, and, and gain access to the anterior aspect of the spinal canal. As you start resecting the uh, vertebral body, if you don't have a temporary rod in, you've essentially now uh, 
achieved a three column destabilization of the spine and you can get a subluxation quite easily and that can result in a spinal cord injury. So the, the temporary rod doesn't have to have serve a corrective function, it doesn't have to extend across all pedicle screws. At this point you've actually placed the, the pedicle screws that you're going to be needing. Uh, you simply contour it to the deformity that's, that exists and it's just there to hold things in place. Proceed with the corpectomy which generally involves uh, identifying the discs above and below, resecting them and then finding the lateral margins obviously of your mass and, uh, and working from lateral to central anterior aspect first and then working posteriorly where generally speaking the last thing that we resect because now you've got a cavity to push the, uh, the material into is the posterior extent of the cortex or tumor and once you have this, uh, once you have this corpectomy completely done uh, then you proceed with the kypho correction. The kypho correction actually involves placement of a full length appropriately contoured rod now on the contralateral side to your, uh, to your temporary rod and then ultimately correcting the uh, deformity after which time you can actually apply your cage, place a second rod and then uh, uh, compress across your cage. So that's basically the, uh, the technique in a nutshell and this is what it looks like prior to application of the second rod. At this point, the deformity is corrected with the unilateral definitive rod. You've got an expanded cage. This is your nerve root that's been, uh, your nerve root that's been severed here. It's been sacrificed. This is the other end of the nerve root, which doesn't necessarily need to be ligated, but for demonstration purposes, uh, it's useful. And then, uh, obviously, the second rod is placed. I'm going to show some, uh, some cases. This is uh, a case that's near and dear to me because it's probably, if, as far as I can remember, my first uh, costal transrectectomy in practice. This is a 33-year-old woman who uh, is, was an East African immigrant who came in with a progressive neurological deficit. She was Asia, barely Asia C, heading quickly towards Asia B at this point. And you can see that she's got this uh, translation and kyphosis. She's got this anterior paraspinal posterior abscess given her, her uh, immigrant status and the appearance of this, tuberculosis was suspected. And sure enough, uh, we performed again at the T3 level, or I'm sorry, T4 level, where access is quite, uh, quite difficult. I uh, performed a costal transrectectomy with this reconstruction, which, uh, uh, which ended up uh, being very successful as she recovered completely neurologically back at work in six months. And uh, it was actually not that difficult the procedure relative to the anterior uh, T3 to T5 type of exposures I had, I had done in the past. And this is again emphasizing how I th useful I think this is in the uh, upper thoracic spine. This is a 78 year old male, metastatic pros prostate cancer way up in the thoracic spine, T3, Asia C. Uh, the difficult that would have been difficult to access from an anterior approach. You can see the spinal cord compression and the collapse in this patient again. Costal transrectectomy. you see that this was instead of being reconstructed with a cage, uh, reconstructed with a, uh, an allograft normally used for lumbar interbody arthrodesis and several levels above and below. And you see the uh, successful reconstruction and this is primarily bone graft as you see here. Now this case is up at T2 and if you look at this, when you look at T2 and say well perhaps we can access this from an anterior approach and I think Yes, that's a possibility. In my experience, every time it looks close like this, it's much, much deeper hole and much more caudal than you expect from the CT alone. And, uh, and ultimately, probably due to the biomechanical uh, features of this as well, the ability to perhaps, or the difficulties perhaps in instrumenting down to T4, or actually down to T3 in this level, I should say, uh, the chances are this patient would have required at least an anterior posterior if an anterior approach were selected. So again, I think a, a good candidate given the location for preferentially a, a costal transrectectomy approach. The one thing to know when you're working up there is uh, the, the vertebral body is, tends to be quite wide or the pedicles tend to be quite wide relative to down at the uh, uh, thoracolumbar junction or in the mid thoracic spine and so you'll tend to you, you'll tend to have difficulty working contralaterally as much and difficulty centralizing the cage as long as you're aware that that's the case uh, you can generally work around it. Uh, down, working down in the mid thoracic region I'd say at this point you get to the area where it's dealer's choice to some extent anterior posterior 
uh, versus costal transvasectomy. Some of the advantages of costal transvasectomy I mentioned previously, it's still an area where I prefer to do this for metastatic disease. This was uh, what was suspected in this gentleman. So you can see 50-year-old male, Caucasian, never traveled outside Washington State, I believe. Uh, Asia C neurological deficit. You can see he had no known primary, not, nor did anything show up on his uh, preoperative imaging. And he had this uh, intraoperative fro frozen section was uh, inconclusive, and the ultimate final pathology came back as tuberculosis, which surprised everyone. And of course, the family was ecstatic because uh, the alternative was certainly much worse. And uh, this patient recovered nicely and went on to have uh, full treatment for his tuberculosis. Thoracolumbar junction, I think, is an area where people are equally as comfortable as uh, through the costal transvasectomy approach as through other approaches. Uh, again, for metastatic disease, I, 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 uh, I generally prefer the costal transvasectomy. I think you can actually get, even with renal cell carcinoma, which is uh, um, a mass that we know, uh, we know or think at least that it's preferential to debulk as much as possible you can get a very effective uh, debulking and excision of the tumor mass from a, from a posterior approach alone. Here's an example of a 64-year-old male. You can see post-op. This is all bone graft here. Just put this uh, as an example of how you can do a really, I think, a, a very nice resection. Uh, and you have adequate visualization to do so even from a posterior lateral approach. And I've shown examples of anterior reconstruction following these approaches every time, but not every case <coughs> needs a full corpectomy, not every case therefore requires a reconstructive procedure. And this is an example, a non-tumor example, but that applies to the tumor realm as well of a gentleman who simply had a disc uh, excision and then we ended up taking down both the sets. So we basically um, still did a posterior instrumentation to stabilize him, but he had no anterior column deficiency. Now, obviously a very versatile exposure, vertebral column resections for, for uh, fixed deformities, as you can see here. This is sort of post-traumatic fixed deformities. Uh, really uh, uh, the ability to mobilize the spine and reconstruct it like, like really no other in single approach that we have. So in conclusion, costal transvasectomy, uh, costal transvasectomy probably underutilized still, less now I think than in the years past. Uh, it seems to have a similar safety profile than uh, anterior plus or minus a posterior approach. It gives you a 360 degree visualization. I think it's something that is extremely useful that everyone should become familiar with and have in their armamentarium, even though I think even in a, in a high volume tertiary care trauma center like this, we don't do a ton of them. Uh, they're, they're still rather, I wouldn't say they're un, rare or uncommon, but they're certainly not common. Uh, it, one of the advantages in, in um, I'd say, kyphotic reconstructions is that it allows you to reconstruct the kyphosis without shortening the neural elements, like for instance, a PSO would in a non-tumor situation, obviously. And that can have implications, especially when you're at conus level or at cord level. And essentially, it's a useful tool for many, uh, for many pathologies. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your attention.